and welcome to another edition of Shaka Extra Time. I am Paul Ndiho. Joining me on set uh, live uh, is Shaka Sali himself, a.k.a. the Kabale Kid. Hello, Shaka. Hello, Paul. How, How are you? Terrific. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. It's just that I'm um, uh, kind of under the weather. Very sorry about that. And um, I also gather, by the way, that uh, by extension, even your family is under the weather. That's correct. That's correct. Yeah. But you know, at least as a consolation, you look hugely terrific. <laughs> More kudos to you, my friend. Yeah. <laughs> a warm welcome to you, all our Facebook followers are watching us live. Our Shaka Extra Time is a place where you get to talk to Shaka himself. And uh, today we'll be taking your questions on democracy in Africa. Uh, Shaka, uh, right away, let's maybe start uh, in the DRC. We have a new president-elect uh, in uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, your thoughts? Uh? We have a new president-elect in the DRC, but of course, as you know, not everyone is happy, including the African Union chairman, Rwandan president, Major General Paul Kagame. Uh, interesting. Uh, it's funny that you say that one of our first comments uh, is uh, from uh, the DRC. Somebody wants uh, to know what you make of Africa Union's uh, uh, involvement. Uh, his name is Derek in Sibiona. Uh, what do you make of Africa Union's uh, uh, involvement in the DRC? I think uh, that uh, the involvement um, is good. Um, especially if, in fact, the involvement would have started at the beginning, especially when they are organizing elections and all that kind of stuff, if they had, in fact, come up with a specific definition that uh, in order for an election should be to be accepted by the African Union or the member states of the Continental uh, Union, they need to meet certain specific thresholds. But for the manner in which the African Union tried to react or respond to the results from Kinshasa, you know, yes, they did have some concerns. And they were probably right to have those types of concerns because that was like uh, a reflection of a big segment of the Congolese people. Mm -hmm. The problem is the choice of the particular individual that was going to be the mediator there are a lot of people who would have said, uh, probably quoted former U.S. President uh, Barack Obama. He could have said, given that kind of task, that uh, that was probably above his pay grade. The reason I'm trying to say that, I'm looking at uh, Rwandan President Paul Kagame. When it comes to democracy, there are a lot of people who will tell you, to be very honest with you, that that should have been above his pay grade because the last time people will say they checked there is really no democracy that you could talk about in rwanda if you look at the type of election that uh, they have been holding in rwanda under kagame's rule there are a lot of questions to be asked really and then when you look at the fact that uh, his country has also been involved militarily in that particular region and that in fact he even has the distinction of having helped to have a president rule that country in the name of Rora Desire Kabira, the father of President Joseph Kabira back in 1997, if I remember correctly, that was the result of a Paul Kagame having led his army in cooperation with other armies like Uganda, like uh, Angola and some other armies to the extent that uh, they overthrew a government which was uh, led by uh, Mobutu Seseko Wazabanga and installed another individual called Radezile Kabira to be president of that particular country. But this was not an election. He should, yes, he should take credit for having done that. But then, let's face it, I think that he should also accept the fact that things have changed. Society is not static. It is dynamic. If you look at, for example, the mapping report mm -hmm. of the United Nations, there are some allegations such an extent that, in fact, some commentators have suggested 
that if that particular report, for example, were to be heard or tabled in a court of law, that Kagame, as president of Rwanda, probably could have, in fact, been accused with either genocide or acts of genocide. In Congo? In Congo, even though, of course, uh, Kagame denies that, denies those charges. So I don't think that when you look at the manner in which he tried to mediate the situation in the DRC, I don't think he was the right person, frankly, to try to do that. Uh, I like the fact that, uh, yeah, you've sort of uh, brought uh, that uh, historical and uh, political context, it, uh, but uh, we're looking at it uh, from the geopolitics uh, of uh, that uh, region. Uh, there's a lot of people who argue that uh, President Kagame perhaps suffers from a deficit of democracy in his own country. Uh, was he really, really the right person uh, to uh, to send to, or trying to mediate uh, in the situation in the Congo? Or is uh, uh, Mr. Fawaki, the AU chairperson, oblivious to the fact uh, of what's going on in the Congo? I think that uh, there are people who will say that uh, the message probably was actually right on the money. It was right, it was correct. But that the messenger, by the name of Paul Kagame, was a wrong messenger. That when you look at the context of democracy, if you are living in a democratic kind of uh, glass house, that you should not really feel that you have the luxury of throwing stones. Mm. Because those stones could actually be sent back to you. And if they do, you know what would happen. But I think having said that, there is no excuse why Africa or DRC itself should not, in fact, organize elections whose results, at the end of the day, reflect the will of the people, not the will of the individual who announces those results or the will of the people who count the vote. Uh, but Shaka, maybe to just to push back a little bit, uh, uh, a lot of Congolese uh, uh, are saying that uh, some of the results uh, reflect the will of the people. Uh, even the, uh, the constitutional court to vote uh, sort of agrees with uh, their decision or what they've been talking about for a while. You are right. Uh, uh, when you look at the different opinions that obtain in that part of the world, I think that um, it should be said that people are entitled to their different types of opinions. But that does not necessarily mean that uh, they are entitled to their different sets of facts. Uh, and when we talk about uh, the Constitutional Court, yes, you're right, the Constitutional Court actually called it. It dismissed Martin Fayulu's uh, petition. But people will also tell you that when it comes to the Constitutional Court in the Democratic Republic of Uganda, uh, of the Congo, including perhaps the entire Great Lakes region, those Constitutional Courts, or Supreme Courts, as you call them, are not necessarily independent. Those types of courts are subordinate to the executive, executive who obviously is reflected in the incumbent president. But how is it different from, for example, the United States here? We have a Supreme Court that uh, has literally been taken over by a conservative group of judges, uh, all appointed by the president. How different is that if you're trying to make that argument on the Congo? Would it, uh, if somebody made the similar argument about the United States, the composure of the U.S. Co uh, Supreme Court, uh, would that uh, make a difference? Well, I think that uh, you will really be on very shaky grounds because uh, there are situations in history where people who have actually been judges who have been appointed by individual presidents have actually gone on to call it or cast their vote in a manner that is a reflection of their conscience as opposed to a reflection of who appointed them. Now, what and makes you think that it's any different from the Congo? These judges could have followed the law, and the fact that uh, 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 Mr. Uh, Fayulu did not adduce enough evidence uh, in court. You know, I think that I'm not in a position, for example, to, add, to argue that court uh, in a court of law, because 
I happen not to be, first of all, a trained lawyer. I also happen not to have, in fact, looked at the evidence that uh, you are alluding to. But one thing that is very clear is that uh, there is the Catholic bishops in the Democratic Republic of the Congo who command enormous respect, who also appear to be perhaps one of the few institutions in that country that is broadly respected and that it had actually come with a different point of view. I am also told that when you look at uh, the other evidence that has actually been seen, for example, I don't know whether you are able to read uh, uh, an article in uh, the Financial Times of London. They even used what they characterize as forensic evidence, analyzing the data that was in fact available to them and reached a totally different conclusion. So I think that uh, I am not going to waste your time or the time of audience uh, arguing this case. All I can say is that there are very, very outstanding questions regarding the election results in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. It is also very interesting, by the way, that the ruling coalition led by President Joseph Kabila lost the presidency so badly, but for some reason actually won a majority, not simply a majority, but in fact a landslide when it comes to the election of the National Assembly. And so, I, you know, I, I would like to think that uh, surely if they could not vote for the president, the candidate of the ruling party, I don't see honestly why they found it very easy to vote for a huge landslide of individuals representing that same particular party mm. that lost the presidency. So your call, you know, um, is probably as good as the evidence. And where is the evidence? I don't think the evidence, from what I see, uh, pretty much really uh, seems to have been the basis for reaching the decision as to who actually won this presidency. I have also even heard, by the way, that uh, a man like Martin Fayuru was supported largely by what you would call multinational corporations, that he was su supported by countries like uh, former colonial rural Brit uh, Belgium, Belgium, that he was supported by the French and what have you. And yet, a person like Kisekedi, who happened to have credentials from his father, Etienne Kisekedi, that was a man who was perceived to be a Congolese nationalist. And that therefore, there are some people who may in fact have been able to vote for him on the basis of saying, look, this is a Congolese nationalist. I think we should go with him. Because if we go with Martin Fayul, we'll probably go with allies of those who actually may be responsible for having assassinated our hero. Patrice uh, Good point, good point. Uh, let's uh, follow up with uh, two comments. Uh, one from Alien Abarukundo. Do you think the West should continue to influence the outcome of elections in Africa? And a uh, second comment, uh, Otomeri, Otomeri Kayambo. Uh, how did imperialist countries uh, intervene in African politics? I think, first of all, uh, when you talk about influence, how the West influences Africa and what have you, it is really up to Africans themselves, the African people, to be able to gain or regain their confidence and their dignity so that they can assert themselves, mm -hmm. so that they can assert themselves and be in control and call the shots when things like Africa come on the table. Mm. I don't think that Africans should consider themselves as victims, really. I think Africans should assert themselves and be the giants on their own continent. Uh, how about, uh, how do you respond to this comment from Muhammad Hassan? Uh, Africans are always a total 
a tool for Western nations and have no political transformation because all African leaders sustain the power since their life ends. I don't really think that uh, that person can prove uh, his uh, allegation uh, that Africans are this or that. I think that uh, one could probably talk about some African individuals in the form of African leaders or African rulers, some might say, yes, they have actually been, in a sense, sellouts to the extent that they have actually been uh, or have been fitting a category that uh, is said in Swahili, you would say Nyampara, that they have actually fit that category of rulers who basically reflect and promote the interests of foreign policies that actually reflect the interests of other people mm. rather than their own people, the Africans. So again, I think that it is up to the African people to be able to step up to the plate and pressure the people they consider to be their leaders to indeed reflect their own African concerns and needs. Uh, we seem to be getting a lot of our comments uh, on the issue of democracy. I think this is uh, what uh, rallies a lot of uh, young people across uh, the continent. Uh, let's go to another comment along uh, the same uh, lines. Uh, he says, uh, uh, is democracy a kind of Western colonial policy that, uh, forced, uh, that is forced upon Africans? On the contrary, I don't think that uh, democracy is owned by any particular individual. Even though when you read history, especially Western history, you will discover that uh, the type of governorship that we call democracy may have in fact originated in modern day Greece. May have originated in modern day Greece. And to be honest with you, democracy was supposed to be an improvement over the manner and the types of governorship, of governance that obtained at the time. Democracy, when you think about it, has some tenets that are not really unique to any particular culture, any particular geography, any particular race, any particular religion. You have tenets, sincerely, which are universal, such an extent that uh, they can actually be regarded as a universal type of language. For example, Paul, when you talk about fairness, where I come from in Kavali, there's no doubt that in our community, fairness was considered to be a positive value, justice. When you talk about justice, you talk about accountability. When you talk about freedom of expression, for example, these were supposed to be community values they were definitely not meant to be monopolies controlled or serving the interests of the Western world. Uh, speaking of the Western world, let's go to another comment from uh, Amos Chisisi. Uh, Western countries should stay away from African politics and uh, they must stop using fake bishops in the DRC. Your thoughts? Well, I think that uh, Amos is probably doing a little bit of uh, exaggeration here because, frankly, I don't know whether he has that capability, for example, of knowing that those bishops he's describing as being fake are indeed fake. He has to come up with uh, the evidence that makes him think that way. He cannot, I think, be allowed to really generalize to the extent that he actually ended up perhaps using an, a sort of abusive language or a language that is environmentally and socially unpleasant and unfair to some of those individuals who may in fact be very sincere about the, the opinion that they hold. Uh, how about uh, Wilson uh, Mbao? Why is the church busy with the politics instead of preaching the good news in Congo? Well, first of all, when you are a member of a church or you are a bishop, it does not necessarily mean that you abdicate your responsibility as a, citizen, as a citizen 
of that particular country, society, or community. And so if you're a citizen, and in addition to that, you also hold an office or a job, it also means that you have a right to own an opinion, especially if that opinion contributes to the potential well-being of that particular society. Uh, Shaka, uh, somebody of Eric Amot says, you quoted the Financial Times of London, uh, but this particular publication forces uh, continue to exploit the Congo and its people. Sorry to say, Shaka, the Catholic Church is part of that too. I don't know. Uh, unfortunately, I think unlike that particular individual, I do not have that kind of evidence. And I'm not in the business, frankly, of speculating or simply calling out uh, a particular media organization simply because that particular media organization may in fact belong to the British. Uh, let's uh, talk a little bit about uh, what's happening in Zimbabwe. Uh, there is a lot uh, at stake in Zimbabwe. Uh, we thought uh, with the election of uh, President Emerson Nangagwa, we are going to see a new Zimbabwe. You and I were there covering the elections. Uh, but since then, uh, nothing really much has happened on the ground. Uh, riots uh, are all over the country. People are protesting against high, uh, the cost of uh, fuel, the cost of food, uh, the living uh, the cost of the, of living there has actually uh, shot through the roof. Uh, your thoughts on uh, what's happening in Zimbabwe? Zimbabwe, of course, as you know, is a very, very complex uh, situation because, yes, you did have uh, uh, changes in terms of uh, the man at the political helm of the Zimbabwean society, uh, Robert Gabriel Mugabe, uh, being replaced by uh, a former uh, colleague, ally, and uh, mentee, actually, uh, Mr. Munangagwa, as it were. But unfortunately, nothing much has changed, and partly because there are people who think that the elections that we witnessed uh, were not really elections, that those, in fact, elections were, in their words, not mine, selections. But the other thing also, which is very, very important, Paul, is for people to know that Zimbabwe happens to be under enormous sanctions. For example, Zimbabwe happens to be under sanctions from the United States of America. The United States of America happens to wield veto power, for example, on some of the Britain World institutions that would be responsible to provide or lend some monies to the government of Zimbabwe. And I'm talking about the International Monetary Fund, the IMF. The United States is the only country that actually wields a veto. And those, uh, those sanctions, I think, let's face it, if you talk about them, if you look at those sanctions and what they can actually do, mm. I think they can help us to explain why Zimbabwe is where it is right now. And as a matter of fact, uh, uh, you know that uh, there is this annual business meeting in Switzerland, yeah. in Davos. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, I was reading a statement uh, by uh, the president of the Republic of South Africa, Cyril Ramaphosa, actually appealing or urging uh, the West, and in particular the United States, uh, uh, essentially really to end these sanctions because Zimbabwe, at least according to him, seems to be on the right track. Uh, let's cross over to West Africa. Let's go to Abdullah Abu du, Abdullah Abdu. Hello, Shaka. I'm watching from London, uh, UK. Today, it made one year since a former football star turned politician held uh, uh, state power in Liberia. What do you make of his one year in office? Uh, where is Liberia today? I think about uh, uh, the jury is still really out uh, when it comes to Liberia, and we are talking about, of course, uh, a former international soccer star, George Weir. I think we need to give him a little bit of time in, uh, just before uh, we begin doing the sort of political post-mortem. I think that we should be a little bit patient 
uh, and look at uh, some of the policies that uh, he has put in place and how some of these policies eventually, uh, you know, either produce results uh, or at least in terms of uh, whether or not they can actually make a difference. So I don't think that uh, it would be really uh, time for me uh, to weigh in in that particular case. Give me a couple of months and what have you, and I ask that question again, and I promise you that I will do the best I can in order to answer it in a manner that will also be fair to George Weir, depending on, of course, uh, what he said and whether he's been able to, you know, to walk the talk. Because a lot of politicians, as they say, when they are running for office, they do it in the poetry. They promise heaven on earth. But when they come to the business of governing, someone will say they, in fact, end up governing through pros. Because, you know what, they have to deal with the social, economic, political reality that they actually find in place. And so I think that it is very easy for politicians to talk the talk. But when it comes to walking that talk, my friend, they have to look at the realities that they have to deal with. Uh, what are you talking about at tomorrow in Straight Talk Africa? Tomorrow in Straight Talk Africa, it is very interesting that uh, you ask this, uh, especially given that uh, we almost exhausted the issue of democracy. We are actually going to do a bit of what I would call, or at least what is called in the American university curriculum, when you talk about the basics of a discipline or a lesson, they say it is economics 101, and tomorrow, we are going to attempt to talk about democracy in the context of democracy 101. Very interesting. We are probably <laughs> going to find out some various definitions of what is democracy. There are some definitions that say, for example, democracy is the art of all possibilities. Mm. Another definition can also say democracy is about really people. It's about who gets what, when, where, and why. There are other definitions also who will say democracy actually means the art of making the impossible possible, possible. and the art of making the possible sometimes impossible. And so we're going to be looking at democracy in that broad context. Uh, so, very briefly, uh, we have a, a final comment from Mikhail Salfas Nwagaba. Why is the Western world interested in African politics? And uh, real quickly, uh, uh, let's go to, uh, first go for that one. The Western world is very much interested in African politics because, let's, let's guess it, I mean, let's be honest. When you think about uh, life, life requires the resources. And the last time I checked, Africa perhaps holds what you would consider to be enormous resources that will help people to live good lives. Africa has all the minerals you can think about. It has the land that could in fact be the, broad bas the bread basket of the world. That's the reason why the West is interested in Africa and it's not limited to the West. What about Asia? Talk about China. Talk about India. Talk about Turkey. Talk about Brazil. The entire world is interested in Africa because Africa has a lot of resources that can make a difference in people's lives. Well, uh, on that note, uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us uh, on this uh, edition of Shaka Extra Time. We look forward to having you on another edition of Shaka Extra Time. Until then, uh, thank you so much uh, from Washington. Uh, good night. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm.